So um, let me introduce you our first speaker. Uh, she's, from, she's from Mexico. Uh, her name is Violeta Romero. And the title of her presentation is The Mexican Fossil Heritage, an overview of the Colección Nacional de Paleontología at the Instituto de Geología, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. So welcome, Violeta, whenever you're ready. Hi, Hi. thank you. So hello, everybody. Good evening. I will talk to you about the fossil collection housed in the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, in Mexico City which is the most representative and diverse fossil collection from Mexico. Next slide, please. The history of the collection begins at the end of the 19th century with the foundation of the Geologic Institute by the Mexican government. The institution was in charge of the geological research in the country to exploit the mineral resources. Soon, paleontological research became necessary and the need of a fossil collection was evident. The first location of the Institute and its collections was the building constructed ex professor near the actual Mexico City downtown. After the foundation of the National University in 1910, the Institute became, becomes part of it as the Institute of Geology. With the building of the Ciudad Universitaria campus, faculties and research institutes moved in. And the old building in downtown remained for exhibition purposes only as it stands until today. Next slide, please. The Institute reached its current location in 1977, where it began the establishment of the former management system of the collection. Dr. Carmen Perzillat became coordinator until 2014 when she retired. And in uh, 2004, the university's main principal recognized the value of the collection, naming it as Colección Nacional de Paleontología and its enclosure as María del Carmen Perrillat Montoya Museum. Next slide, please. The collection, or the CMP for uh, uh, her shortage, houses five collections. These are the five collections which uh, has the published material, including type, including type series and voucher specimens. It contains vertebrates, invertebrates, and ignofossils under IGM acronym, the microfossils collection under IGM MI acronym, and plants as IGM PB. Next slide. Next, please. Next, please. Another one, sorry. The geographic reference collection with the material under study, under study or waiting to be studied. It grows after the collects, no, uh, one back please. It grows after the collects of researchers and is organized by locality. The foreign material that contains specimens from other countries as the result of interchange or donation the recent material collection that, uh, as its name says, it provides the basis for the comparison of fossils to extant specimens, and uh, for last, the molds and duplicates collection that holds material resulted after requests of type specimen duplicates. Next, please. Mm, yes. The total amount of specimens held in the CMP is hard to calculate since the geographic collection is managed and organized by locality. So this means that as there are localities with, with a single specimen, there are also localities with a batch between two to several hundred specimens. What we know for sure is that the total of vertebrates, invertebrates, and plants in the type collection is almost 12,000 specimens. The collection began its systematization in the 80s, in the first decade of 2000, as part of a university's mega project. The type collection began a digitization program whose main goal was to make worldwide available the information. As a result, the web portal Unipaleo made available the inform both information and images, yet we faced some limitations. More recently, 
the university recovered the advances and began a new project. One of the main products is the Portal de Datos Abiertos or Open Data Portal, which is continuously growing. Because of the importance of the type collection, we took the task of collecting data of the vertebrate and invertebrate specimens, including type status, state of provenance, geologic age, and taxonomic class to present a general overview of the most complete fossil collection from Mexico. Next, please. The first point we looked for was the proportion of vertebrates and invertebrates. As expected, the invertebrates hold the major representation with 79% of the total. What is this saying to us? Well, we interpret this from different angles. Next slide, please. Mexico's geologic history shows us that the territory was dominated by, by marine environments until the Eocene, Oligocene epochs. So, as invertebrate representatives of the collection are mainly from the marine realm, this is a reflection of our geologic history. Also, the taphonomic processes play a role in this proportion due to the nature of each, of each biological group. From a different perspective, we relate this to the research fields developed in the Institute, which a few years ago were dominated by invertebrate paleontology. Next slide, please. Looking closer at the taxonomic composition, we find that the best group represented for vertebrates are mammals. This responds to the country's Cenozoic geologic history and the mammal dominance during this era. Bony fishes are also well represented, which is consistent with the presence of the marine environment in our deep time history. After this taxonomic review, an inconsistency in the data jumps into sight. We have distinct taxonomic ranges in the class level. As an example, we can point out the Osteichthyes group that should be ranked as superclass and the telostate group as an infraclass. Next slide, please. For invertebrates, we see three main groups whose great abundance is explained by the dominance of marine environments during a long time in the territory. As before, we can identify a taxonomic inconsistency that is related to the changes in the classific classification system of brachiopods. Next slide, please. Where do all specimens come from? Well, being Mexico, a country divided in 32 states, we have records from 20, 26 of them. Four states hold the highest abundance and 10 of them have a low abundance with less than 200, 200 specimens. The invertebrates maintain the total abundance pattern with San Luis, San Luis Potosí and Puebla, the best recorded. But for vertebrates, one single state, Guanajuato, holds by far the highest abundance. Next, please. When we plot the localities by state, we see two of them with the highest numbers. These two correlate with those with the highest specimen presence. For vertebrates, five states hold the highest numbers, and for invertebrates, six states have the highest abundance. For both groups, the best represented states are distributed all along the country and shows a more homogeneous distribution as we see more states with closer numbers. Next, please. What time frame do we have recorded in the type collection? We have a record of all three eras of the Phanerozoic. The Mesozoic is the best represented by means of invertebrate abundance, but the Cenozoic, in spite of the low abundance, we have similar abundances between both groups. Finally, the Paleozoic has the lowest presence and only represented by invertebrates. Next, please. Uh, about the type status, the CMP is mainly composed by, by voucher specimens assigned to the hypotype status with the 66%. Even though this category is not recognized in the nomenclature codes, its use in ex is extensive in paleontological publications. The holotypes constitute nearly 4% and are mainly invertebrates, and nearly 23 are paratypes. We also have a record of four more type categories with a low presence in the collection. 
Next slide, please. So to conclude, what can we take from these numbers? Well, this is a first approach to composition of site collection. As its name, name bears, this collection is the best reference of the paleontological record from the country. Yet, problem, problems like the taxonomy categories have to be solved as scientific collections are taxon, taxonomic references. Additionally, it could result interesting to plot the historical pattern of these numbers to describe how does Mexican paleontology had evolved within the, this research center. What is the future of our collections? Next, please. As we continue to grow, space and resources become necessary. Maintaining and improving collections are the main task we have. Yet, as this new sanitary emergency has placed all over the world, it makes evident the necessity to boost the digital technologies to keep going on our task. The CMP will continue to the best endorsement of the achievements of paleontology in Mexico. Its staff and associated researchers are committed to promoting the formation of paleontologists interested in recognizing the paleontological heritage of the country. Next, please. Thank you for your attention and attending to this talk. Thank you, Violeta. Uh, that's beautiful. Is there any questions that you would like to ask Violeta? Remember to go to the Q&A and um, ask your questions. I have uh, some, well, first of all, we have 222 uh, people here in this room, which is awesome. Uh, let's see. Um, Julie Shapiro uh, is asking, if you conduct outreach, how is that accomplished? And now with present issue, how is your institution coping? Oh, oh I'm sorry, I, I, I don't understand the, well, the, the first part. part. Um, if you conduct outreach, es decir, si ustedes hacen como um, educación como extensión al público, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. how is that accomplished? And how well, do you cope with uh, the current situation? Well, uh, right now uh, we have uh, some, um, we call them in Mexico uh, social services that involve uh, to the students, bachelor students in the, in the collection to work with us and they have many tasks. The, their main task is to help uh, us in the, is the everyday uh, work we have. Because um, a big uh, problem that, that we have in the collection is that we are only two persons, two people in the collection as permanent staff. Mm, I am the collection manager and the coordinator that is in charge more of the administrative uh, problem. So uh, I have a, a big uh, amount of work in, with me. So the, the, the students help me with, with all this. And this is how we involve uh, the students in, within the collection. And we try to get interest, uh, to make interest in, in, in them to work with, with collections, for example. And now we have stopped all uh, all our work in in the collection because we can uh, we can enter to the to the institute it's closed so i i can do some work from home like uh, uh, giving some uh, catalog numbers that uh, are required or uh, uh, reviewing some literature or uh, localities but uh, the work as as it as working with uh, the specimens is uh, stopped. We can't uh, work in there right now. Okay, uh, thanks, Violet. I have some uh, comments here in the chat from Sambi, um, Cristina Bird, um, Cristina Rufino, and Viviana Londoño. All of them say thank you. That was amazing presentation. Uh, from you um, and Julie also, since you answered her questions, she's saying thank you. Uh, so thank you. thanks, Violeta. Thank um, you. So I will now introduce you to our uh, next speaker. Um, 
She's going to start in four minutes. Um, she's Viviana Londoño from uh, Colombia. And the title of her talk is History of the Cartagena Botanical Garden Herbarium, uh, the most important plant collection from the Caribbean region of Colombia. Uh, so I think uh, we should wait just a couple of minutes before starting with Viviana. Viviana, would you like to do a sound check? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, yeah. Would you like to turn on your video as well? I was trying to do it, but it, it says that I cannot because the administrator stopped it. Oh, the video? Your video? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Hang on. I think I, I changed the setting. Hang on. That's totally my fault. Okay, try it now, Viviana. No, I Perfect. can't. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. I was playing with settings <laughs> and I should not do that during a live session. <laughs> <laughs> Do not worry about it. Okay, so I have your presentation ready to go. Um, whenever we're ready. Violeta, could you please mute yourself? Oh, yes, sure. I'm sorry. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Viviana, can you hear me and see me? Yeah, I can hear you and see you. Uh, will that be big enough for you for three minutes and then one? Okay, perfect. Excellent. All right. to start getting ready okay. for you. I'm going to mute myself and go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Viviana Londoño and I am the scientific director of the Cartagena Botanical Garden. And I'm here to talk to you about the history of the Cartagena Botanical Garden Herbarium, the most important plant collection from the Caribbean region of Colombia. Next, please. So to start, let's talk about where it's located. Uh, the Cartagena Botanical Garden and the Starbarium are located in the town called Turbaco near to Cartagena. Uh, the town uh, is a part of tropical dry forest uh, from Colombia and is far from the Matute Upper Drainage Basin, which is the main basin for the city. To both Turbaco and Cartagena have been very important places with respect of the botanical history uh, of the Caribbean. Uh, next, please. For example, in 1758, Nicolas Jacan, an important expeditionary of the Caribbean region, uh, arrived to Cartagena and amused by the variety of uh, the plant diversity of this area, uh, found and described many species. Those we have some species that are named after, after Cartagena, like Tripocentrum cartagenensis, Erythroxylum cartagenensis, and uh, as it says there, Elicteris baruensis, that is called after the main island, uh, Baru in Cartagena. Here uh, you can see a book uh, published by our current uh, director, 
Santiago Madriñán that talks about the expeditions uh, of Japan from um, 1754 uh, to 1759. Next, please. Another important scientist that visited the area was Alexander von Humboldt in the 19th century. Uh, he arrived to Turbaco because he first arrived to Cartagena and hated the climate there. He said that it was extremely hot and he cannot uh, adapt to the climate. So he went back to Turbaco, which is a little bit more fresher. And here he was amused also by the diversity uh, of the tropical dry forest and described some species and name it after uh, the area like Nectandra turbacensis, that is the one that we can see in the picture. People call here that plant ahi and Estilogenia turbacensis. But he also described another characteristics of the area like uh, a mud volcanoes. Next uh, slide, please. This is a picture a painting that he drew in his diaries uh, about the mud volcanoes in Turbaco. These are Turba uh, volcanoes that are due to the diaparism in the area. Next. So given all this historical botanical setting of the area, Maria Jimenez de Piñeres donated the lands for the garden. And in 1978, uh, with uh, along with the Central Bank of Colombia, they founded uh, the Botanical Garden of Cartagena, and with, then, uh, with, the, with the garden, uh, the first herbarium of the Caribbean region in Colombia. Among the sage commissions that created the herbarium was uh, known uh, scientists like Richard Evan Schultz, uh, Christian Samper, and Peter Weiss Jackson. So to tell you the story of the uh, herbarium, I'm going to divide uh, the presentation in four main periods. Uh, next slide, please. The first one uh, was from 1978 to 1995. During this period, uh, the herbarium was built by uh, the architect, landscape architect Graciela Dominguez, and the collection started to grow. All the research, the expeditions, and the scientific work in the herbarium uh, was funded with the, by the Central Bank of Colombia. And important botanists as Victor Manuel Patiño and Hermes Cuadros work in, the, in building this collection. During this time, uh, the collection received a large amount of plant material from expeditions to the, uh, for, from the, first expeditions to the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta and another areas from the Caribbean, becoming the largest plant collection of the Colombian Caribbean. Important collectors and researchers such as Gentry and SAC eh, also made part of the researches that contribute with their plant material to the eh, herbarium. Next, please. The second period was between 1996 to 2003. Uh, due to new legislation uh, from Colombian uh, Republic, the Central Bank wasn't allowed to fund any more uh, foundations like the uh, Cartagena Botanical Garden. So it started a long separation process and uh, during this time there was no funding for research, no funding for expeditions, no funding for uh, hire any kind of staff. So there was no creator and no maintenance of the collection and their barium entering a state of abandonment. Next slide, please. So the third period during 2003 and 2015, um, I started with uh, the manage of the botanical garden by a private company. And then in 2009, thanks to uh, Isahen, there is an electric company who gave, that gives, uh, gave funds uh, for recover uh, the collection, the Medellin Botanical Garden and another public uh, institution uh, start a process of recovering their volume. During this process, they had three goals, three main goals. The first one was the systematization of the collection to generate a virtual database. It's important to know that till this moment, uh, all the database of their volume was in paper, so it was a huge work. 
Uh, the second uh, was to update the taxonomy of the collection. It was abandoned by 10 years, so they want to update the names. And the third one was to restore the plant material that have uh, entered in a damaged state because of the abandonment of their barium. Once they leave in 2010, uh, their barium remained with no predator until 2015. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of how their barium was in 2015, uh, at the beginning of the last period that I'm going to talk to you. Next slide, please. Uh, so since 2015 to today, a new scientific team arrived. Now we have a scientific director and an herbarium manager that we were able to work in the collection. And we work with fund uh, from private companies and we also have been developed a volunteer um, program with the Universidad de los Andes and Universidad de Cartagena that had helped us to get some undergrad students to work at the herbarium. Now uh, our collection is 14,000 specimens, is uh, the second largest collection uh, of the Caribbean region in Colombia. And uh, we have been able to establish a seedling collection for, the, for reference and a seed bank uh, collection annexed to the herbarium. Next slide, please. Thanks to a project developed between 2016 and 2017, we were able to publish about the 25% of the collection in a online web in Flickr, which is called the uh, Tropical Dry Forest Herbarium Project of Colombia. And, and you can check uh, the collection if you're interested. And now we are also get, trying to get in some phones uh, to uh, finish this work of publishing our collection online. Next slide, please. Well, I want to thank you and inviting you uh, anytime you came here to Cartagena to know our botanical garden and our beautiful herbarium. Thank you, Viviana. That's beautiful. And I've been there and I can tell you guys it's beautiful place. Whenever you go to Cartagena, you have to visit that botanical garden. Um, so uh, here in the chat, there is a question. Please remember everyone to, uh, to make ask your question in the Q&A, but I'm going here with the one in the chat. Um, it says, Catalina is asking, do you have bryophytes and lichens collections at the herbarium? Uh, well, Last year, we have an undergraduate student that started a um, uh, collection of lichens, and, but it, it hasn't been integrated with the plant collection, but it's in our future plans. Okay, great. Um, also, Riley is asking, how were the specimens damaged and how did you go about repairing them? Most of it uh, were like box that is the paper. So we just uh, unmount the plants and put it again in a new paper. And that, that was the most of it. But it wasn't not surprisingly, although it were, were past like 10 years in the state of abandonment, the damage wasn't that big and it could be solutioned easily. Okay. With hard work. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alana Rivera is asking, was there a significant loss at the herbarium during that period of ab abandonment? I'm sure it's been a lot of work to recover, she says. Yeah, it, it is a lot of work and we're still trying to recover this work. And to the date, I cannot, we are starting to review again all the database that they built at the time and review again all the specimens uh, so we can check the status and see how big was the damage from uh, there to now. And we really don't have the exact amount now because it is a large process, it's a very long process. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Carmen is asking, are the species collected by Jacan and Humboldt still extant in the forests around Cartagena? Yeah, they are among our leaf collections. Um, we have a Jacan collection under development now. And some of the species that I show, you can find it in Cartagena. If you walk on a park in Cartagena, you can find Erythroxylum cartagenesis easily. Or if you go to Baru, you can see Elicteris baruis ensis easily. Great. And Donna Young uh, says, thank you, Viviana. 25% uh, of collection imaged is great progress. Uh, do you have volunteer staff? Do you have what? Sorry? Volunteer, volunteer staff. Um, no, we, okay, we have volunteer staff uh, to continue this process, but we don't have the equipment, the camera. That was, uh, we can, the, uh, we can upload that 25% because it was like a grant during a time. They uh, allow us to use a camera, but uh, when the time was over, then they took the camera. So we haven't been able to upload more images. Okay. Uh, so is asking something technical about the collection. If you know what kind of insects attack the specimens. No, we haven't seen. Uh, I have seen some borkids because we also have a seed collection and those I can recognize them really well. But it would be really interesting to do uh, work of taxonomy on, on the bugs that attack the specimens. Mm hmm yeah uh let's see okay and one more from Dirk Newman um is the long-term funding of this crucial research infrastructure more or less secure now would more international relations help to secure your situation well we are not secure <laughs> We are just working every day to get the funds to continue working on our barium. And we are sending grants, projects, application everywhere to get funding. And that's how we have been working their barium. So if you have any idea how to help us, don't, please talk to me. <laughs> Okay, and one more question from Adriana Lopez Villalobos. Um, do you guys have issues with pests? And if you do, how do you tackle this? Um, now we use uh, pheromones to capture some of the bugs that enter in the collection. It's, it's, it was very difficult because, you know, the herbarium is inside the garden and the garden is like a forest. So it's, it's difficult that. And we also, um, clean the collection and use pesticides once every six six months to uh, protect the protect the collection from bugs. Okay, yeah. So those were mainly the questions. I'm just going to pick some uh, comments here from the chat. There's one that I have to say because I'm I'm, I'm skewed uh, here. Uh, Ricardo Paredes says once again EBB. Everything is better in botany, <laughs> and yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Viviana. This was great. Um, and just stay around for the for the end until the end of the session, okay? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amalia. Okay. So um, in five minutes, we are going to have our next speaker. Uh, he's Fernando Alzate. Um, the title of his presentation is HUA, a very active herbarium in Colombia, working on the knowledge of biota and its conservation in one of the most diverse regions of the planet. Um, Fernando uh, submitted a video, just uh, so you yes. know. Yes, Fernando, so you, yes. okay, you have audio yeah. and video, you're fine. Okay, hello. Great, wonderful. So at uh, 10, you know, whatever time 10, uh, you are in or whoever is in, um, I'm going to start the video. But in the meantime, I made a little comment in the chat. So for any of you that are interested in learning about uh, pests attacking uh, museum collections, you can go to museumpests.net. 
it's a great resource for everybody. So go ahead. Um, and Sultan Gulf is asking for bibliography in Spanish for pasts. Um, and I can say that we're working on it. That's all I can say for now. <laughs> but yes, it's a great resource for everybody that's interested in um, learning how to deal with pasts and what are the most common um, attackers of collections. Okay, I think uh, we have three more minutes until uh, Fernando starts. And uh, I, I, I just have one question that popped up in the chat for Viviana. So if you are still there, Viviana, this is from Jairo Pinto. And he says, he's saying, thanks for this huge work. I'm wondering um, if there are some Isoetes collections or high mountain samples from Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta, recent ones. I think we have some, uh, if you can, email me i can tell you more about the details of these collections from sierra nevada um, Great. So, so i'm going so to share I'm, my, I'm going to share my email <laughs> because i think it's better to answer that with the database of the herbarium awesome Good evening. Thank you to the organizer of the symposium and to you for attending. I want to briefly introduce you to the Herbarium Collection of the University of Antioquia, HUA, which has more than 200,000 specimens, actually. The collection focuses mainly on establishing the plant diversity of the Department of Antioquia in Colombia, a region that represents one of the most interesting biota convergences of Mesoamerica, Andes, Pacific, and Caribbean, which is why we have a very diverse and particular flora. And this due to its location in the northwestern part of South America with two Andean mountain cordilleras in our region. The geological and environmental characteristics allow us to have different ecosystems and vegetation in the area with a high diversity, like tropical forest, Andean forest, and paramo formation. The regional diversity is not fully established, actually, and we have nearly 10,000 vascular plant species, of which 10% are endemic including many microendemisms in different groups. Some taxonomic groups occurring in Antioquia and different areas require more detailed studies and explorations. HUA was founded 50 years ago by Indonesian botanist Jaya Soyartu, 
And on this slide, I want to present two historical collections from our institution. In the middle, you can see the specimen number one included in the herbarium, which is an Oroban case collected in California in 1965. And in the right is the oldest collection represented by a Jamaican passiflora that was collected in 1847. Currently, the herbarium has more than 220,000 specimens, which are mostly properly cured and identified. HUA is a very, very active herbarium, especially due to the constant presence and visit of taxonomists and students of our institutions and from other that allow us to have a very dynamic collection that grows day by day. Uh, actually, we are located in the university city of the University of Antioquia in Medellin. Most of the conserved specimens belong to angiosperms with 76% for this group. 91% of the collection are from Colombia because our location. But we have specimens, of course, from other countries, especially, especially from South America, on, included Ecuador, Brazil, Peru, and other countries. In the maps, the best represented areas in our collection, both in Colombia and Antioquia, are in red. We have, as you can see, part of the territory unexplored or with a very low sampling intensity, such as the Pacific region on the northern part of the Andes, where we hope to have a large number of taxonomic novelties. The HUA collection includes some freshwater and marine algae specimens. The fungi are very well represented with about 13,000 specimens and it's one of the most important collection for us thanks to the fact that the herbarium has experts in the area of mycology that have active exploration and studies both in the department in the country and in the neotropics. Lichens has near to 2,500 specimens and is perhaps the group that should be reviewed most urgently as we have problems identifying them. Bryophytes has a considerable representation in the collection with its three large groups and has been widely collected and studied at the regional level. Various collections of ferns and related species we have in the collection, and this is largely due to the presence of active taxonomists for this group that make field exploration and a very current identification of specimens following current classification proposals. Gymnosperms are not very diverse in the tropics, as you know, but there are some well-represented neotropical groups in our collection, such as Samiese and Podocarpaceae. Our largest collection, of course, is from angiosperms, with about 175,000 specimens that includes about 260 families and 70,000 species, many of them endemic to this part of the neotropics. Well, additionally, we have a collection of fruits, seeds, and flowers and liquid for some particular groups uh, that allows detailed studies about morphology and taxonomical characters collection of pollen samples on plates as well as sam samples of preserved tissues for DNA extraction have also been established in the herbarium. 
This allows to identify, for example, cryptic species and to develop phylogenetic analysis. One of the most valuable collections of our institution is type specimens, which has a considerable number of vouchers and species. And we can see that this has been growing with increasing field explorations and with the study of specimens by specialists who visit uh, our herbarium. In the slide, you can see, for example, the voucher on the left that is the last holotype in, in the herbarium. The best represented families in the type collections are, for example, Araceae, Piperaceae, Rubiaceae, and Melastomataceae, and are almost 1750 specimens and 790 species represented in type specimens. The collection can be consulted online at the address that you can see in the slide, but it is pretty large. And you can do different types of searches. It is still a beta version that we hope to improve soon. We hope that. We have almost all the collection available at this moment. The current objective of our herbarium staff is to fill information gaps in areas that could not be explored and for which we have great expectations as they are of great interest in terms of the flora found in them. For this reason, we hope to generate many collections, many more, in these areas. For example, the Pacific, the Andean region, and many more. Which is more possible now in the post-conflict stage in Colombia. Finally, I want to highlight that the HUA is a source of information on the diversity of the Northwest of South America, which is representative and has adequate preservation conditions. And surely we have a considerable number of taxa that with a detailed review for experts can represent taxonomic novelties by discover. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I hope that this information will be of interest for your research. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Fernando. That was uh, you're welcome. Thank you that very was much. A, a very, very clear video, very understandable. Um, so I want to see. Okay, there are questions already. First, uh, Carmen Ulloa had a comment. She was saying, need more exchange among the Andean countries. Uh, yes, I agree with Carmen. We have problems. Uh, we need to, to have more exchange with other herbarium, another herbarium in, in Colombia, in South America, and in the continent. But we have had some legal problems to export specimens, as you know, Tamale. By other groups. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there is, um, let's see, another question here. Uh, excellent presentation. Are you digitizing your specimens? Yes, we have almost all the collections um, available at the address that I put in the presentation. Yeah, most of the collection. Okay. Uh, Genevieve Tochi is asking, what a fabulous herbarium, is saying, what a fabulous herbarium you, uh, how are the mycological collections housed? Um, <laughs> yes, you know that fungi is um, all the time at the herbarium. We have, I think that is the, the, the adequate conservation rules for the fungi 
in our collection. Uh, we have two experts in our institution that are that take care of the collection. So I, I work with the, the plants and in the other department, they are take care of, of fungi. Okay. Mm, Yvette Harvey says, fabulous talk. Do you also collect cultivated plants within the region? And she's saying, she's sending greetings from WSY Herbarium. Mm, yes, we are interest, interested to have all the diversity in our herbarium. Uh, we have some works about that. And Absolutely, we are interested about that. Okay. And Carmen is coming back uh, about the comment that she had before. And uh, she wants to ask you if, if you think that it is desirable to promote exchange of collection in the Andean countries. Mm, we are trying to have a more frequently exchanging uh, uh, vouchers in Andean. The problem is the legal situation now in Colombia because there are many, many tasks to do before to export and to import plants. So that's the problem, but we are interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. A little bit of promotion wouldn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't hurt, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Corver is asking, do you have problems sending specimens out of your country because of permits? I think you just answered that. Yes. Yes, we have many problems with the permits to export, but it's, pro it's possible sometimes. We need to, to do many different legal tasks before to export, but it's possible, yeah, mm -hmm. in some cases. Okay, so here is another question from Carmen, uh, but mm -hmm. before that, I need to tell everyone that Fernando just described a new species of the genus Speletia very recently. So uh, Carmen's question is saying, uh, is asking if the Espeletia shown at the beginning of the video is the one that you mm -hmm. just described. Yeah, exactly. Is that the same? Is the holotype of the new species. Nice. Great. Uh, Jairo Pinto is saying, thanks for your presentation and your awesome work. Would you confirm the HUA virtual herbarium address to us? It was exposed very briefly in the video. So if you can just write it on the chat. Oh, I, can. I can send you, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you for that. And um, Silvia, <laughs> Silvia Lobo wants to know mm -hmm. if you have a tissue collection. I think you mentioned something. Yes, yes we have, we have um, almost 3,000 specimens for, for DNA extraction available. If mm -hmm. somebody needs uh, some sample, or let, me, let me know to, to send or to work, to cooperate. Great. Uh, some comments from the chat. Uh, Sol from Argentina, she's saying that they are also having great trouble with the law you know, moving uh, the material in and mm -hmm. out, uh, outside mm -hmm. of the country mainly. Mm -hmm. um, Christina Bird says, nice presentation. Mm, great talk, Fernando. Um, Donna Young, fa fantastic collection. Uh, love the last slide, beautiful herbarium specimens. And that's, there's a lot of comments about the beautiful specimens that you guys have. Um, <laughs> so yes. <laughs> Thank you, Fernando. Um, I don't know if there is something brief that you think you, you would like to add. We have a couple minutes. Mm. No, um, I Amalia, have... yep. oh, we mm -hmm. might have one more question. Um, mm -hmm. F. Hitchcock okay. has their hand up. Um, did you want to ask a question verbally? I can turn on your mic. Mm -hmm. um, if you unmute yourself now, you can you can talk. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, that was excellent. Um, I was starting to write in the chat, but I can say out loud. Um, when you provide tissues 
uh, tissue samples, as you said that you do, uh, do mm -hmm. you have a, a, a benefit sharing clause that's included in that relative to the Nagoya protocol? Yes, we try to do that. We are, we are in law about that and we have all the permits and for the collection that we have in Medellin. Yes, we, we cooperate, for example, with the uh, Instituto von Humboldt in Colombia with all the regulation about that. Yeah, and Nagoya too. Great, thank you. So that, uh, it seems like that was the last question. Thank you, Fernando, that was awesome. Thank um, you very so much. Let me in, in <laughs> so let me introduce you guys to our next speaker um, at seven, at, in three minutes, we're going to have uh, David Ocampo and the um, title of his presentation is the birds and eggs collection at the Humboldt Institute as a tool to explore and conserve avian biodiversity in Colombia. Hello, David, would you like to do a sound check? Sure. Great, we can hear you. Would you like to turn on your video? Wonderful. So we are ready to go in two minutes. Um, okay. I can start sharing the screen in advance because you have um, this one first. And in two yeah, minutes, I, I will start the presentation. Okay. David, can you see me? Um, no. Uh, wait. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. So three. Okay. One. Got it? Perfect. Ready when you are, David. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is David Ocampo. I am the bird curator of the Alexander von Humboldt Institute. And now we are going to talk about ornithology collections in Colombia. Particularly, I want to share with you our work at the Bird and X collection. And it's very exciting work that involves a lot of collaborations and researchers. Next. Let's, let's, let me start to saying that to be a biologist in the neotropics is very exciting. Exploring from the lowlands in the regions such as Chaco, the Amazon basin and, and valleys, next. And going up to the mountains uh, in the Andes until the Paramos, places where oh, one of the highest degree of endemism as Fernando just told us in the last video. Uh, right there in this complex biogeography, biogeographic region, different processes had led the diversification in several lineage. Next. And as a result, we can find in Colombia almost 2,000 bird species, species that <clears throat> to study and preserve all this biodiversity is an important and huge challenge, which requires to develop in a high quality biological collections with a wide taxonomic cover. Next. <clears throat> Next, please. Thanks. And 
And here we have the biological collection at the Humboldt Institute, located at northwest of South America in the Eastern Cordillera in Villa de Leyva, one of the most peaceful uh, towns in Colombia. And in this map, first you can see where are our collections in the green spot with the red line. Actually, I'm talking to you from there too. And the yellow dots represent especially every spe single specimen in our collection in Colombia, which, are, we, which has a good representation principally in the Andes. The light green areas are natu national park which were well explored during the 70s and 80s by the National Institute of National Resources. Then in the late 90s, the Humboldt Institute Biological collection, Collections were created with all these specimens from several groups. All this, uh, all this point in time, we reached almost 70,000 specimens with a taxonomic cover of 70% of the birds in Colombia. And we are excited about the next expedition, of course, as soon as is possible. Next, please. Now, <clears throat> let's check the collection. We have 30 of these cabinets, each one with several trays of different size. And there we keep uh, the specimen, save it, and organize it according to the South America Classification Committee. And we are using those external labels as an index. Next. For some of those species with a proper series of specimens, we separate them by geographic region or subspecies when recognized. It. And, what, and what about the labels? Next. Well, well, naturally, through time, our labels have improved in terms of material used for the labels and the information reported in it. And we are even implement QR codes. Simultaneously, we are, the amount of information collected now with the specimens has, has expanded. For instance, we recently started a spread wind collection. Additionally, we began to study stomach contents and we are also articulated with our collections of tissue samples and environmental sounds, where in some cases, keeps voucher vocalizations of the specimens collected. This is collection is growing and making important collaborations with other bird sounds collections, such as Macaulay Library of Cornell and Senocanto. Next. As you know, some of the most important specimens are the type specimens. The published list includes uh, 10 specimens representing two holotypes and eight types of the three nominal species and five nominal subspecies. Three of them also have tissue samples. Um, there in the left, you can see a white acid-free boxes where we, we keep them safe. Next. These specimens belong mainly to neotropical cryptid families such as Rhinocryptidae, Tapaculus, next, and Gralaridae, Retororois, next. As I mentioned before, our spread wing collection is growing. Now we have 751 wings from 284 species, representing 37 families and 13 orders of birds. And we are still exploring the best way to stock them, keeping in balance the, uh, the balance between the safety of the wings and the space available in the collection. Now there at the left, you can see an example of how this is done in the ornithological collection of Cornell. Next. And I wanted to introduce you, our crew has been very diverse as well. There are some of the people involved in logistics on um, the field expeditions and collection work since the beginning of the Humboldt Institute to the present time. Currently in the Beard collection, we are just Socorro and me. Next. As I said previously, to work in the, with birds in the neotropic and actually with heavy growth is always exciting and some is in unexplored places they still keep new species to be found. An example of this is a recent found Pita, a genus Gralaricula, 
currently under description with the specimens in our collection. Next. Another approach in this study, uh, in the study of geographic variation is like this robust study on bush tanagers describing subspecies based on a specimen from our collection and the Institute of Natural Science, the, the biggest uh, bird collection in Colombia. Next. And a molecular approach was used on a specimen collected in Cauca Valley almost two decades um, ago in 2002 in, in the map you can see the grain cross in order to fill in gaps in the phylogeographic history of the Gralaricula ferrogenii pectus, a rare amphitheon. Next. Um, we are working on some interesting collaborations such as Chapman Reservoir Project that involves important national and international researchers and institutions with the aim to assessing change in bird communities through uh, 100 years of change in the landscape. And in the right photo, you can see a very exciting collaboration with researchers from Ecuador with this amazing hummingbird. And next. Now the X, um, this might be the biggest or for sure one of the biggest X collections in Latin America. It begins in 2001 as a donation for the professor Cornelis Marinkele with around 25,000 eggs from all around the world. It has a wide, a wide taxonomic cover with approximately 2,000 2, species. Um, for Colombia, the story is completely different since all the eggs are from around 150 species that were collected in the field during our expeditions. One of the of my main interests is brain biology and trade evolution, and I am open to start new collaborations. Next. Next. As a consequence of this interest, the X collection is getting stronger and more productive, even with some publication about natural history of some birds. Next. Um, if you come visit to visit the collection, you will find these woody cabinets with fiber cover uh, to keep and the air flux and control the humidity. Next. And, uh, and that is how the X looks like. In each box, it's a complete cl clutch with cotton bed and protects um, protected with anti-reflex glass. And now we are next, we are working on the digitizing the, all this information, this remarkable legacy of the professor Marin Kelly and the idea is to use all this data in several projects from field guides to research that I am developing on tried evolution and nanostructure of the actual. Next. Well, I hope that I explain how we are exploring the study of the avian biodiversity in Colombia with uh, the Birds and Eggs Collection at the Humboldt Institute. We are working on advising regional and national conservation initiative and Red List. And also, very importantly, we are getting involved in science communication strategies, um, sharing our knowledge about biodiversity, biological collection, and their importance with, important, importance with different people throughout the country. Finally, next, I want to thank so all the biological collection staff for all that hard work and all the researchers and collaborators working at the collection through all these years. And of course, thanks to you for listening. My, my email is on the branch <laughs> next to the green toucanet if you wanna write down the contact. David, that was great. Um, yeah, so you can, uh, whenever you check David's presentation, uh, you can also see his email and his uh, Twitter account if you want to connect with him. Um, uh, so let's check uh, some of the questions that are there for you. Um, Bentley Berg, Bentley Berg says, uh, what beautiful labels. Does your institution use the QR codes for location control as well as bringing up the specimen data on a program? That storage is beautiful. Well, um, I'm not sure if I understood <laughs> the question. We, we use uh, 
Kevin, which is our data curator, he he's the guy in charge of the labels and all that process. We use a specify for all the data and I think he used he uh, a different program for all the labels and to, to set the different um, information in the label. Yeah, as far as I know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going just to be part of the answer because David and I work in the same institution. Um, we use some QR codes or start or start doing it, but we don't use them still to for location control or bringing up specimen data. We are just starting to use the codes just like that with the oh, uh, okay, yeah. catalog number. Yeah. Um, Diana, Diana Tilea, uh, she's asking, can you speak about the benefits of spread wings other than storage benefits compared to whole specimens? Okay, yeah, that's, uh, those kind of preparations are uh, relatively new and, and the spread wings helps to study uh, the whole radio of the wing. You know, like you can you can use it for malt studies and and for all this dispersion analysis that a lot of people are using now in order to study how the the birds move through the open areas or or forest and and with the spring wind seems like is the whole info you can have the whole information about the uh, egg uh, shape. No, not just size, but shape. Um, and yeah, that's like improving that information that in the past we just took from a, a proxy. We take measurements of the first uh, primary and the, the last primary and the first secondary feather um, in order to have a, a, a proxy of the sh wing shape. But with this collection, now we have the actual shape of the wing. Okay. Um, Alison Wilkins is asking, how are you digitizing or photographing the egg collection? Sorry, <laughs> can, can you repeat it, please? Pardon. Uh, how are you digitizing or photographing the egg collection? Uh, okay. Uh, for now, we are just uh, digitizing the information um, because we, all the information is in those all levels with in a lot of different languages. Uh, but then we want to take photos uh, with, with the same camera that I show in a picture with the, with the hummingbird, with the curved bill. So yeah, we are just taking the pictures with a really good equipment. Um, and then, okay, I, I guess I can say that. Uh, and then we are, use, we are going to use an app that help us to study the shape of the egg in, or in, in terms of elongation and asymmetry. Um, and yeah, you don't need like a really good picture for that, but even with your cell phone, you can use, uh, like, you can use that app. So we, are, we have uh, really good pictures for the guy and for some species, but for all the 25,000 eggs, we have like a regular photo that help us to um, to do the study. Okay. Uh, Lauren Smith from the Field Museum in Chicago is asking, can you elaborate why the cabinets are wood fiber rather than metal? Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I wish you can see the, the picture. Uh, actually, that was like two decades ago. For some reason, the people who uh, who was in charge of build this these cabinets uh, suggest the that like that material and that kind of uh, fiber in the in the doors, and for now uh, it it works very fine. But but yeah, I I visit some collections in in other museums and they use like regular cabinets and that works well too. Mm -hmm. Um, Gavin Hank is asking if for each bird, do you prepare a partial skeleton, a skin, and a spread wing? 
Yeah, well, we we prepare a speed uh, the we the spread wing and the skin, and we are saving um, the the eyes actually and and the spirit like the carcass. But we are not doing a skeleton yet. We have a very small skeleton um, collection in, in the uh, in the bird collection, but is is. We are not like that is not where our main one of our main uh, objectives with that. I am very interested in eventually go in the and and work with the skeleton collections too. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Chris Milinski wants to know this. It says from Chris and Carla. Is it possible to import export bird material from Colombia? Are loans possible? Yeah, hi Chris and Carla. <laughs> um, yes, it's possible. We, as Fernando and Amalia said before, um, we, we have to do some like paperwork, but it's possible. Um, it depends on the institutions and um, you have to like very specify very well what are the objectives of the uh, collaboration, but it's possible, yeah. Um, here is a um, question uh, that comes from the chat uh, from Alison Wilkins. Uh, she's asking, what is the app you use for the egg pictures? Yeah, uh, we are, since we are just start, started with the pictures, I am still wondering about which app use. I, I know that um, a, a friend of mine, actually for the film museum is working on an app and I am talking with her and maybe in the future we can do some collaboration. And Maria Stoddart, she published a very like a huge paper uh, and she used use it uh, and some analysis that I am interested to. So I, the, I have do, those two options to explore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, two more questions uh, really fast. Julio Acuna uh, is asking, where do you think efforts should be focused today for the study of birds in Colombia? Wow, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, we, we, we need to keep uh, going to the field. We still have a lot of gaps in the knowledge and in a lot of groups, even birds that uh, um, a lot of people think that is like most uh, one of the most study, uh, studied groups. We have uh, a lot of um, places in Colombia uh, with zero specimens, for instance. And then we need to, um, I think one of, of the main um, challenge for us is to to share the importance of the collections for all the people, because here the and I, and I assume is the same in other in other places. Um, a lot of people, even biologists, uh, are not aware of the importance of the collections. Okay, so yeah, we have a couple more questions in the Q and A, uh, but it's time for the next talk. So um, Elizabeth is uh, taking you to to the chat, so you can answer the questions also in the Q and A part. Thank you, David. That was great. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Amalia, um, will you be sharing your own screen or would you like me to do that? Uh, you can go ahead and do it. I mean, it, it has been working okay from your side. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, in the meantime, I'm telling you the next speaker. Oh, well, that's me. I'm the last speaker of the session. <laughs> um, um, and the title of my um, of my talk is Facing Environmental Challenges in the Midst of uh, Megadiversity. How are the natural history collections of the Colombian National Biodiversity Institute contributing to this, um, to this goal? Um, so next. Thank you. Um, uh, the thing that I want to um, 
talk mainly here is what is the role of biological collections uh, right now that we have discovered all this hidden, I mean, there are having papers that say that hidden potential information behind the physical um, specimens. We have all this bunch of information that can help us it can help uh, to you know to counter the um, the effect of all these environmental challenges that we are facing today. So uh, we can see it as a balance where there is a non biodiversity, and that is the traditional um, use of collections. That's why they started. But now we are putting a lot of focus in providing additional information to help. Um, not, I mean, to not to lose this biodiversity. So we do it by digitizing, promoting research, and educating. Next. But if we add an extra um, ingredient, oops, one before, thanks, um, to this uh, recipe, which is mega diversity, well, we have a situation, and, and if you have seen, Many of these talks from uh, by mega diverse areas or Colombia or the tropics, they are focused on still describing species because we still don't know what we have. So we have to, you know, to focus strongly on both sides of the balance because otherwise we would be losing all this biodiversity that we still don't know. So it's a, it's a double challenge for us. Next. So uh, this is, as you already saw, uh, the picture of the building uh, of, of where collections are located. Uh, we are the Biodiversity Institute of Columbia, the um, Alexander von Humboldt Institute. And the institute started in 1995. And at that time, we received five collections from this uh, other institution that you see there called Inverena, which was in charge of the protected areas. And now, 25 years later, we have 12 collections. Uh, so I'm just gonna tell you how have we faced the situation that I talked uh, about before. Next. So in terms of uh, how are we documenting our biodiversity during these 25 years, we have became the second largest uh, biodiversity repository in the country. Um, we have more than 2,000 types. That includes more than 300 holotypes. Um, and three strengths from our collections are uh, first, that we have a good representation of protected areas because we inherited all this from Inderena that I told you. And you know, accessing and collecting protected areas right now is very difficult, especially in a mega diverse country. There's a lot of red tape and things like that. Second, uh, we also have good representation from remote areas uh, because our main mission is just to document uh, the biodiversity of the whole country. So we have been in places where no other institutions or universities have been. And the third is that you can see uh, where the majority of the dots are concentrated. Uh, that's the Andean region. And that's one of the, the tropical Andes are considered one of the biodiversity hotspots. So we have a very good representation of that one too. Next. Um, just so you have an idea of, in general, the representation of the Colombian biodiversity in our collections. Um, Colombia has approximately 58,000 species described to date, and we have around 35% of that represented in our collections. Uh, from 78% of amphibians down to 27% of insects. Um, David already told you that we are the number one country in birds and we have 65% of representation. So that's uh, very valuable. Next. And um, talking about this other part of the balance where we start providing valuable information that goes beyond the specimen. We have, um, with the time, within, during these 25 years, we uh, have created or came up with extended collections. So um, there they are, there are five. Uh, next. The first one is the A collection. 
you already heard David about talking about it, all the value and the data that it provides. Next. The other one is the spread wings. He already talked about it too, and that provides ecological information that you cannot get from the specimen, from the skin. Um, next. We have our tissue collection that started in 1998. Basically, I mean, like any tissue collection, it contains pieces um, of tissue and also DNA aliquots. So for all these molecular uh, studies, so it provides molecular data. Next. We have our seed collection, which is part of the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership. Um, so we have to talk with our Chilean colleagues uh, that talked today about the Indian's uh, seed collection. And the main focus of this collection is conservation of native species in threatened ecosystems. Uh, next one. We have the environmental sounds collection where the data that we provide is mainly by acoustics from different, um, different groups, mainly birds. Uh, it contains, for example, 71.7% .7 of endemic birds of Colombia. Next one. So what do we do with all this information? We already have it. So then comes the digitization. Uh, here is the pipeline. We start with the expeditions, then doing the curatorial work. Everything goes to specify is in our, using our internal database. And once it's there, it goes to a local node of GBIF, with, which is the SIB or SIP Colombia, and then goes to GBIF. Currently, we have 92% of our records already there in the SIP Colombia. Next. Uh, here is just an example of some studies that are uh, required our information, the information from our collections that has a huge range from ecology to um, conservation to bioresilience in, term, in terms of post-conflict in our country. So it's a, a huge variety of topics that can benefit from our collections. Next. And in terms of education, I, I highlighted three uh, main branches that we have. First, we have uh, educational events and uh, educational visits and events. Here are some pictures of the last year's International Museum Day. We have talks about biodiversity for general public, uh, which we started monthly and in person. Right now we're going virtual because of the pandemic. Um, and we also have training and workshops for other collections. Uh, to, you know, to start networking with local collections because sometimes we are too isolated. Next. So of course, to keep this balance between these two um, in mega diversity, mega diverse countries, we face challenges that we all know are there. And, you know, defunding uh, priorities, sometimes government or the institutions. And here I'm not just talking I'm not talking about my institution or our country. I think this extends widely. Um, funding priorities, of course, political instability. Sometimes uh, you have the funding, but something happens. So the government takes the money for something else. Um, there's isolation, as I mentioned, uh, which is one of the reasons why I decided to organize this symposium. Um, and the pandemic, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> which, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> mm. which um, we were not expecting. Thank you, Elisa. <coughs> so, um, uh, next. So here is a example of these challenges and that we have to pay attention to them. Um, <clears throat> One of them is that uh, the fire at the Rio Museum, and I know this morning someone talked about it because it was a huge loss, like a 200 years loss of history because it was defunded. Here I'm including a quote um, that was um, basically blaming the government because when 
it was their 200th birthday, no one was there. This is uh, from an um, excerpt from The Guardian. And here is a local example for here in Colombia. Um, remember I mentioned we are the second repository. The first one is actually in the National University of Colombia and the building where their collections are is, con is condemned basically. They realized last year and now they are running and starting to see what they're gonna do. But everything that happens because of, of these challenges that are so difficult to keep this balance for us. Next. So um, that's how I conclude. I just want to thank you all for being here, you know, until the very last uh, talk of the day. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Spinach and the conference, um, all our past and present colleagues um, at the Humboldt collections, and all our national and international partners. Um, just as a curious uh, fact, fun fact, uh, Millennium Seed Bank Partnership, when this conference was gonna be in Edinburgh, they were gonna be my sponsors. So uh, they're there, uh, mainly because of that. So uh, thank you. And now, I'm moving to be a moderator again. <laughs> um, and see if there are, okay, there is a question. There are two questions here. One of them is from uh, Madeline Sylvie, who's asking, is the environmental sounds collection available for online public access? I, yes, uh, it's not through our portal, uh, but Mac Macaulay Library has it, so you can access from there. Uh, Julie Shapiro is asking, has there been discussion about removing or relocating the collection from the condemned building house in the collection? Yes, absolutely. There's been discussion. I mean, once they realized this was happening, they are studying ways to b make a new building or where are we going? I mean, they started to do it, but um, not before, just after that, they discovered that. Any other questions? Um, Amalia, we have one um, attendee who has their hand raised. Um, oh, yeah. um, I've just made it so you can unmute yourself if you would like to ask your question. Absolutely. Luz Miriam, you can unmute yourself. Maybe that was a hand raise without an accidental hand raise. <laughs> Maybe. That, that has happened before. Um. <laughs> uh, so we have one more question here from Lauren Smith uh, from the Field Museum. Uh, she says, your extended collections are impressive. Do you collect parasites from your bird and mammal specimens? And if so, how do you track this data? Or we don't. As far as I know, I mean, I manage the herbarium. Uh, I think we don't, but I don't know if David knows about the birds. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I want to read again the question. Um, the question is asking if we collect parasites from birds. Um, Yes, and, and we have a liquid collection for them. Um, like, like we collect the, the um, reptiles and amphibians. We, we use the same, um, like the same idea. Okay. Um, yeah, any and, other? And there you have the, the, the stomach contents that like, you can work in the future with that. So. Okay. Great, yeah. Um, any other questions? I think there's plenty of time for questions or discussion. Um, I would just like to, I mean, um, oh wait, here is something for David. Have you talked to Kevin Johnson at 
INHS, he will likely be very interested in collaborating with you on bird parasites. Uh, nope, and I will write down that suggestion. Thank you. Um, it's Illinois Natural History Survey. Okay. Um, we have one more attendee who wants to unmute, Sol Tenkoff. Sure. So, hello, Amalia. Nice to meet you. Um, hey. I think I'm very interested in um, one I understand is a big, big problem for natural science and natural history museums nowadays, and is the fact that um, the society doesn't really know the role of uh, our collection, our institutions. It's a very, very important uh, role for the society. And with this situation of the um, COVID-19 right now, at least in Argentina, we are facing a kind of um, different way uh, how the society look at scientists. So I think it's a very important or interesting situation right now to, to take advantage of. Uh, so it seems like the world is looking to the scientists. And uh, we had always, I, I think science had uh, since always a very bad communication with the, with, with the white society. So how can we um, face this challenge of putting the scientific work and collections and natural science uh, collections uh, especially in the, in, on the table. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you, Sol. I think that's a very pertinent question uh, to what we are talking here. Um, if, if we look at uh, big natural history museums, I think they are doing what, what we should do, which is bringing all this, um, you know, knowledge derived from collections. They're bringing this to people. So that gives them like, you know, the, the sensation of this is mine, I understand it. If something happens, I'm going to fight for it, right? Um, and that I think we still need to do that in our region. We are to separate from, you know, our collections or sci the scientists who are in our microscope and no one is doing this bridge or yes, someone is doing it, but uh, it's just, it's a, it's a weak bridge still. So I would say um, trying to put a lot of effort in this outreach, um, exhibitions, whatever our funding allows us uh, to, to create this stronger bridge between our knowledge and the public um, and I think actually the COVID helps to that because virtuality helps to bring information to a lot of people and we are not in our collection. So, so we are forced to be um, creative in that sense these days. Um, I'll just add one thing to that as well. Um, I'm a member of the Spinach Biodiversity Crisis Committee that was just formed in July last year. Um, and we didn't have time to really do a whole lot at this meeting, but we're planning another meeting probably in July or early August to discuss some of these issues more. Um, so just what Sol was saying, like how do we get society to understand the role that we play in some of the major issues um, like with COVID right now. So um, stay tuned for that if you guys are interested in participating. Um, would love to hear ideas that people have and get more people involved. That's right, Talia. If I can make a short comment, um, and then I think we have a couple of raised hands. Um, I think what's important as well is that a lot of natural history museums have focused, or collections have focused mainly on um, making outreach activities for children and not as much for adults. And I think that's something that we have to change. We have to tell people that it's exciting to be in a natural history museum, to be doing this research in a collection. Uh, thank you to COVID in this whole weird world that we're in. Um, the Arroyo Lijaina Collection did a uh, Facebook Live and the engagement that we got was incredible in comparison to what we normally get for our Facebook posts. Um, it was the likes on that post announcing the talk were like 25, 
hundred times what we normally get. It was ridiculous. Um, so I think doing things for adults is, is what matters for us to be able to communicate better who we are, what we do, and why what we do matters. Yeah, that is true. Uh, there's lots of potential beyond, Can I, you know, uh, yeah. I just wanted to say one more thing. I think it's uh, very interesting and important to, to think about. And it's the fact that um, natural science collections are not different from any simple or uh, any kind of collection. It's uh, this idea of, of collecting, in fact, what scientists do, at least uh, at the museum I work, we have 23 different collections. And it's uh, uh, when you look at the scientists are like really like children completing the uh, um, favorite um, football teams uh, albums is almost the same. So that feeling to bring the people uh, understand that feeling is a connection uh, that's very, very strong. I mean, everybody in life have been uh, collecting and sampling things to complete an album. So that's the idea of our museums as well. Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a very simple concept that we can use if we want to get to people. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you, so um, is there anyone else with the hand raised? Kirk, I think hand raised, yes. Yeah, I think our key audience is the political decision makers and not children or adults. At the moment, we have the political negotiations going on for the post-2020 biodiversity framework. And there is huge political pressure because Oops, the politicians recognized that during the decade of biodiversity, not much was achieved. So at the moment, there are negotiations going on to settle the goals for 2030 and 2050, also on the Nagoya. And we have been incredibly invisible. And I think that is one of our major concerns. And uh, being on a conference with... Um, political negotiators earlier this year, um, there was the comment that we are the nice to have ones. And we are not the nice to have ones because we set the basis for all the measures they want to do if they want to measure biodiversity loss. Our problem is that our research and our work in collections does not immediately contribute to those metrics because we are not ecologists and we are not engaged too much in conservation efforts, but we set the taxonomic basis okay. and ground for the recognition of the biodiversity that is around. And if they set the wrong starting point for the metrics, because they measure a crappy environment, then the result will not be better in 20 years. And I think our goal should be to get into contact with the political decision makers because they are the responsible people for our funding and if they do not recognize our work the situation will not improve and as said yesterday so COVID-19 surely is an accelerator but we have seen the massive cuts in collections already last year and the least year before and the year before that so that is not a new situation so we need to rethink our strategy i think yes uh absolutely um i think you're right when you say um we are the ones who have to fight for it not the you know the kids mm -hmm. or the adults but at the same time um the way that we can show them that collections are important is also measured by the impact it has on the public. So um, maybe they're not going to be the ones at the table negotiating, but they're going to be part of the result that we can show 
um, that has a positive and, and strong impact on the society. Any other questions? Uh, I think, okay, I have two more questions at the Q&A. Um, Julio Acuña is saying, it is a challenge to be a mega diverse country. It is a challenge to manage a sample of its mega diversity. What do you think would be the best alternative to contribute in uniting the knowledge of the collections for the different sectors, communities and regions in Colombia? You mean, Julio, if I understand, you are, you are asking how do we, how can we articulate uh, what we do in collections with the other sectors? Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I think that as seeing simply as collections, we can do outreach and get to the society, but we would need a, we, we need a bigger group of people that work in social sciences and all that to, to reach all these other sectors. We have that in our institute and it's very interesting. We are able to do some um, citizen science and things like that uh, because we can articulate with other parts of our of our institute. Um, and Anna Anna Sandoval from Chile, uh, she's asking um, about the seed collection. She's asking, are you do you share or duplicate your collections in Q also? Uh, Anna, no, we don't, uh, especially because of the of the regulations to export the seeds. And so far, even though we still don't have a backup in another seed bank, we are exploring options to do that, absolutely. Any other questions? Malia, I, I don't have a question. I have um, one thing to answer to Dirk. Uh, Dirk, here in Brazil, we have a terrible situation. And I say this because I'm facing problems because I'm a scientist, I work with conservation policies. I work with uh, direct fighting back enterprises like Belo Monte Dan and, and many other problems with environmental issues and politicians hate us, hate us. So I, I don't think politicians is going to help us in any ways. Only if it's in their agenda. Otherwise, you will be persecuted like I am. So that's one point to, to look for. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, any other of the panelists wants to add something? Any comments about, I don't know, the challenges we're facing? Um, something you would like to add to what we have been talking about? Um, Dirk has his hand raised as well. I don't know if he wanted to respond to Alberto. Oh, sure. Despite the, the terrible situation in Brazil at the moment, and we know that because we are closely collaborating with a lot of colleagues from Brazil, and we also formerly had close connections to Museum Goldie, as Fitko was our former director who visited Goldie. Um, the question is, that is international political pressure, and that sheds a light also on governments that um, have, have uh, how to phrase that friendly, um, have minor gaps in uh, sustaining research institutions within countries, because that is a minor um, framework. And there are some negotiators which are um, surprisingly loud during international negotiations. And if you look closely into those countries, you can see the exact opposite of what they tell internationally. So the question is how researchers can team up to expose, um, hopefully, um, the situation and to turn it to something better. And the, the pressure to combat biodiversity loss 
is internationally agreed and recognized. So there need to be concepts. The question is, um, if we want to play a leading role in there and um, we have seen talking to negotiators that usually what you just mentioned. So there are very strong stakeholders which take a lead in these negotiations to inform political stakeholders. And I think it should be us because we have the expertise concerning biodiversity. And um, from, from the role there, what I have learned, um, even though that politicians, legislators, researchers use the same words, they sometimes speak an entirely different language. And I think that is a key challenge that we have also with our visibility, that we need to demonstrate that our work is valuable and we should try to make it more visible. And more visible means, and they're pointing fingers to ourselves, not only to think in our own bubble, but also to see how to get, or how to connect to a larger picture. And we haven't been very good at that during the recent years. Yeah, I agree. But in Brazil nowadays, it's not a good idea. <laughs> yes, it depends a lot of, uh, on the political climate too. I can imagine this, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anyone else from the panelists who would like to chip in about this? Okay, no more questions. So um, I just I would like to, um, I would like to make a just short, just a short comment um, about absolutely. what um, Dirk was saying, and I agree that scientists need to be more involved with politicians. And what I actually think should happen is that those countries with um, more established and better functioning democratic systems are the ones that should be advocates for those countries that cannot do that right now. So if the politicians are convinced in those countries, uh, and it's something that is, it's not a parti partisan thing, that anybody supports natural history collections, every single human um, does that, then no matter which government is in place in those countries, they will put pressure on those countries that are not going through good situations. So I think right now, um, powerful countries are, are the ones that can help those countries that are struggling. And international organizations with a good representation of taxonomists and this is what we are doing and I think we need to think a little bit out of our box so it doesn't mean that one needs to solve the world's problems but well, the question is which strategies we can find and well we are all smart and clever so it doesn't mean that somebody has to do the job on on their own so I think there are opportunities. This might be worth looking into them and making use of them. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There are opportunities. Uh, Talia, are you going to say something? Um, no, just whenever you guys are done, I have a couple of announcements for tomorrow. But you guys still have five minutes if you want to keep, <laughs> keep chatting. <laughs> I can do announcements in 60 seconds. Yeah, I, I wanna. I, I, I don't wanna make an announcement or some not, not um, like that. Anyone it, else? It was a great pleasure to to meet you guys here. Uh, <laughs> I saw all the presentations. Mine was the worst. I'm I'm sorry. I, I had a death problem in my 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 recent life, and so I'm sorry. Uh, and also my internet was terrible because it was starting to rain and was cutting, and so I'm sorry. 
uh, and I think all institutions have problem of workforce, people. And this is something that I don't know how we will address this in the near future. In the, in the long run, I've, I really am afraid of all collections, but I'm not talking about the long run. One of my last slideshows showed that in 1999, we have 310 technicians, researchers, our, our, work for, our workforce was 310 people. Today, 20, 20, 2020, we have less than 200. So we, we, we have a, a cut in the workforce of more than 30 persons. And the next two years, we, I don't know, our museum is one of the oldest in Brazil. It's the second oldest. And we have serious problem with, with people, not money, not funding. I have a lot of money funding for, for research. So it's not problem with collecting or, or getting funds for our collections. We are moving to next NGS. One, one thing that we didn't discuss, we, we have the museums has to address in next generation sequences. Um, it's not the money, it's, it's the people. We are lacking people. This is, the, this is the bottleneck, I think. It's not money to do research. That's it. So it's really, it's really Nice to hear you guys, to see all the presentations, our excellent presentations. Dave, Davi, love the eggs. I love the eggs. And the bottom is, <laughs> I love plants. I, I, although I work with fishes, I love plants. So thank you everybody for all these nice presentations and all these discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto, that's great. Um, I would just like to do a little wrap up uh, before Thalia makes her announcements. Um, and first I wanna thank to all of you, everyone who was here as an attendee, a panelist, I think this was a great selection of talks, but still is a little tiny sample of what we have um, in Latin America. Uh, we didn't even have all countries. Um, so I think this is just a first step to keep the conversation, to see how we can um, keep going, keep going and start going and, you know, introducing us into a bigger international community, which I think is very important. Um, so thank you again.